This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On November the 18th, Virtual Military History Night hosted Professor Ted Glenn of Humber College, who spoke to us about the Battle of the Humber, Canadian cyclists in World War I. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. My name is Patricia Hind White, organizer of this event. Welcome to RCMI's Virtual Military History Night, Wednesday, November the 18th, 2020. This presentation will be videotaped for educational purposes and available for viewing on our CMI YouTube channel. I would like to thank our CMI behind the scenes team of our CMI President Mike Hall, General Manager Garrett Wright, Sylvia Lau, Event Sales Manager, and in house Zoom expert, Jim Lutz, Events Committee Chair, Eric Morse, Editor of our CMI News news, director of publications, a member of our CMI strategic studies committee for their strong support and expertise. Following this presentation, a question and answer period and ask that you mute your, mute your mics and hold any questions through that time. The mute button is on the left of the screen, click to mute and click to unmute. Professor Ted Glenn is an author and educator based at Humber College. He writes about Canadian government and history dividing his time between Grey County and Toronto. His topic, Battle of the Humber, the Canadian Cyclists of the Great War. On a personal note, I was privileged to attend the 100th birthday party of World War I cyclist, Dick Ellis at the old RCMA, RCMI building. I think he told me he worked for a bank after the war and with a twinkle in his eye, had been on pension for many, many more years than the bank had ever expected. Now the story of the Canadian cyclists is largely unknown. 1138 enlisted and 261 were killed. Most of their time was spent digging trenches, patrolling roads, delivering dispatches, but during the last 100 days campaign of Armaines, Cambrai, Cambrai, and especially the 48 kilometer pursuit of the Germans from the Sensi to the Escoot canals, Canadian cyclists finally came into their own. This lecture fo focuses on the first chapter of the Canadian cyclists' Great War story, basic training at Camp, Camp Exhibition in Toronto and Paradise Grove in Niagara on the Lake, fatigue rides to Cooksville and Hamilton, and numerous battles of the Humber. Battle of the Humber explores the largely unknown story of Canadian cyclists in the Great War and how basic training in and around Toronto prepared them for the battle of their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, welcome Ted and over to you and virtually speaking, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. Uh, I didn't realize you're actually at uh, Dick Ellis's 100th birthday party. That, uh, that would have been, that would have been an honor and it a hoot, I would imagine. <laughs> it was, it was, he was a sweet guy. All right, I'm going to uh, I'm going to see if I can share my slides here, and, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll get going. So good evening. Is uh, uh, I was so kind to introduce me. My name is uh, is Ted Glenn, um, and let me begin by saying how how honored I am to be here and share uh, with you this evening the untold story of Canadian cyclists in the Great War. My goal tonight is to talk for just short of uh, an hour, say about 45 minutes, and then hopefully leave some time at the end uh, for your questions, and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. With your indulgence, I'd like to start tonight in a slightly unorthodox way. I'd like to start by skipping to the end of the cyclist story, and I'd like to talk a bit about their role in the last 100 days campaign of the Great War. And that part of the story begins with the Battle of Amiens on August the 8th, 1918. 
Let me set the stage a bit for you here. By the summer of 1918, the Canadian Army had become renowned on both sides of the Western Front as elite, sh elite shock troops. The Canadians had been called on by the British to leave particularly difficult assignments like Vimy and Hill 70 the year before, and were feared by the Germans for succeeding all too well in those assignments. And so, to keep the impending offensive and Canada's role in it secret, the entire Canadian Army, almost 100,000 troops and their equipment, made a 60 kilometer move to staging areas west of Amiens under the cover of darkness beginning July 30th. Now, try to picture the battlefield technologies on parade through the French countryside those hot summer nights uh, 100 years ago. Older ones like infantry, cavalry, heavy artillery, and newer ones like tanks, motorized machine gun lorries, armored cars, and 300 or so bicycles. In the words of one of the cyclists who made that famous ride, on July 29th at 2200 hours, we started off on the famous secret move to the Amiens front, traveling all night and lying low all day. The night rides acted as excellent conditioners for cycling muscles, and the second night in particular, when the battalion covered 57 kilometers in pitch darkness, was the real test of stamina and discipline. All Major Albert Humphreys noted in the battalion's official war diary was we arrived at the staging area at 0600, very tired, having ridden 57 kilometers. Well, no doubt, full cyclist kit in the Great War weighed in at almost 90 pounds. And remember, they were riding at night without any lights on very narrow roads, trying to keep clear of the rest of the Canadian Army moving in the same direction. I think I'd be tired too. It may seem odd to us here in the 21st century, but bicycles were actually a common feature of the early 20th century battlefield. Since the Boer War, in fact, cyclists had been paired with cavalry units to carry out duties that required troops to dismount. One cyclist explained the thinking like this. The act of dismounting deprived a cavalry unit of the services of the men detailed to care for the horses. As one man could only manage four horses or so, the transition from saddle to boot cost a cavalry unit some 25% of rifle strength. A cyclist unit, however, did not have to worry about its mount running off on their own cord or being hit by stray arms uh, fire. In general, the cyclists performed a range of duties on the battlefield. In an advance, one cyclist described their role as being sent in to find the enemy out for the infantry and to keep in touch and warn the infantry of its proximity and strength. Behind the trenches, cyclists patrolled roads. They regulated military traffic, secured important bridge works and crossings, guarded prisoners, supported divisional communications as dispatch riders. And for most of the Great War, the cyclists performed a range of other duties as required, which one said included orderlies, seeking out spies and watching suspects, and supplying working parties for digging trenches and other earthworks. But like I said, it wasn't until the Battle of Amiens and the Hundred Days Campaign at the end of the war that the cyclist specialized training and experience came together. Captain Dick Ellis, who more than anyone else is responsible for keeping the memory of the Canadian cyclists alive, summed up their role during this period like this. It was during that last hundred days when the Germans were being pushed back that the cyclists really functioned as such. At this time, every fourth man carried a Lewis machine gun on his bicycle. Time and again, our lads were sent out far in advance of the infantry to keep in touch with the retreating enemy. And many were the tales of heroism and sacrifice recorded that make us very proud of the unit in which we served. The cyclist battalion cast off the role as poor handymen and engineers and navvies and assume the character for which their training had fitted them. But like I said, this is the end of the cycle story. The beginning brings us back to Toronto after a brief stop at Valcartier, Quebec. The first company of Canadian cyclists was organized at the newly created Valcartier training camp outside Quebec City in September 1914. Following British practice, senior Canadian command created both regimented units like infantry and specialized troop units like engineering and medical units that reported directly to divisional command. Amongst those troop units was the 1st Divisional Mounted Troops, a unit made up of a 196-member cavalry service quadrant and the 93-member 1st Canadian Division Cyclist Company that was drawn from general volunteers. It was Canadian cyclists' mounted status that earned them the sobriquet gas pipe chargers, uh, particularly amongst infantrymen later in the war. We'll get to that rivalry a little bit later on. Once organized into a company, the 1st Division cyclists had only two weeks to train before shipping out for England on October the 3rd. As one cyclist who was at Valcartier recalled though, 
Most of her time was spent filling out forms and undergoing inoculations that left everyone sick for several days. What training did occur was confined mainly to platoon and company drill with a few route marches and some target practice. In fact, only the odd bicycle was available for training at Valcarche. The cyclists actually didn't get their own bike bicycles until arriving at Salisbury Plain in late October. Just as the 1st Division was shipping out, the Canadian government responded to Britain's call for more troops and raised volunteers for a second Canadian contingent, including a second Division cyclist company. These men were stationed at Toronto's Canadian National Exhibition Grounds between October 1914 and June 1915. As many of you are probably aware, Toronto's CNE grounds has a long military history. In 1840, then Lieutenant Governor Sir Francis Bonhead commissioned a new military fortress to replace the neglected and mostly rotted Fort York. The next year, what we now call the Stanley Barracks opened about one kilometer east of the Fort York site with six large buildings including an officer's barracks. It was constructed from limestone quarried near Kingston. This building, the officer's barracks, still stands on the site today. Over the next 60 years, the Stanley Barracks was widely used. Until the mid-1850s, British regular troops called it home until many of them were sent off to fight in the Crimean campaign. With the organization of Canada's militia in 1855, the barracks hosted a military school with such illustrious students as William Otter of the Queen's Own Rifles, based here in Toronto. In the spring of 1874, the first 200 recruits from the Northwest Mounted Police arrived for intensive training that included foot and rifle drill, small arms practice, and familiarization with two nine pound guns. Stanley Barracks ended the century as home to Molly Otter, when her husband, by then Lieutenant Colonel William Otter, led the Canadian contingent to war in South Africa in 1899. The Canadian National Exhibition Grounds, the CNE Grounds, returned to military service in the fall of 1914, when the city offered it to the federal government as a winter training camp for the second Canadian contingent. The canvas bell tents at Valcarche were deemed unsuitable as winter troop, winter troop quarters. Of course they were. Incredibly, in three short weeks, all necessary alterations for troops accommodation were completed. Furnaces were installed, bunks and sanitary facilities were designed and built, and an indoor, indoor rifle range was constructed beneath the grandstand. The Globe described camp exhibition like this in a 1915 article. At Toronto, winter quarters of exceptional convenience were found in the capacious exhibition buildings, permanent structures of brick, steel, and concrete, which had many advantages. Here, during the cold winter of 1914-15, some 4,500 men were concentrated under the command of Major General Lassard. The outdoor drill and route marching in the frosty days gave the men a good hardening, and by spring, several battalions were beginning to have the swing of veterans. A curious effect of this outdoor life was found on occasions when entertainment of any kind was provided for the men in theaters or music halls of the city. After half an hour or so in the superheated air required for ordinary civilian audiences, the soldiers would begin to cough. The unfamiliar temperatures had an uncommonly irritating effect on the throat. Frost air apparently was not a problem. During the winter, the military population at Camp Exhibition grew to almost 10,000. On site, the transportation building served as the drill hall. The bandstand served as the lecture room, the education building for signaling and gunnery, the sheep pen for bakery, butchery, messing, and the government building, now affectionately known as medieval times, served as quarters for both the 19th Battalion and in succession, the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th Divisional Cyclist Company. Interestingly, as we'll see, the annual exhibition fair was able to run as scheduled in the summers of 1915 and 1916 because the troops were moved to Camp Paradise at Niagara-on-the-Lake. For these two summers, CNE planners used the military infrastructure installed on the grounds as a marquee draw. An ad for the 1915 exhi exhibition had this to say, all branches of the exhibition this year will harmonize and blend into one grand outburst of patriotic fervor no doubt the model military camp will attract thousands of visitors, a great many of whom have relatives at the front. As arranged this year, the exhibition will feature displays of bursting shrapnel and bombs, war trophies taken from the Huns on the battlefield, and blood-stained and torn clothing worn by soldiers in the trenches. In 1916, an ad for the exhibition promised a working model military camp west of the transportation building, where, said the ad, visitors can observe daily drill, bayonet exercises, and trench defense and attacks. 
On the waterfront, a naval demonstration will take place featuring combat between submarine and motor patrol, bomb dropping from an airplane, and submarine torpedoes in action. I think with those kind of draws, I might go back to the CN. <clears throat> the Midway even got in on the action. One target throwing game featured caricatures of Kaiser Wilhelm and dared guests to knock out Willie the Warlord's teeth. Hoping to capitalize on the massive turnout that typically attended Canada's national affair, Canadian military planners set up recruiting, a recruiting station on the grounds. There are no records as to how many signed up after riding the roller coaster and eating Cracker Jacks. All right, back to the cyclists. So just as the first Canadian contingent was shipping out from Valcartier for England in October 1914, the Canadian government began recruiting for a second contingent. The 100 or so recruits who made up the second division cyclist company were stationed at the medieval times, oh, sorry, the government building between October 1914 and June 1915. One cyclist with the second division described his company as a very cosmopolitan crew with platoons raised from Toronto, Montreal, Kingston, Vancouver, Winnipeg, and Halifax. And like the rest of the Canadian Corps in the Great War, a good number of the recruits were newcomers to Canada. According to the same cyclist, around two thirds of those at the exhibition grounds were born out of Canada, most of them in the British Isles, but some in Australia, South Africa, India, Japan, France, Channel Islands, Jamaica, and the USA. You can actually see some of that diversity if you take a close up look at some of the, some of the larger uh, platoon and battalion pictures that uh, will come up a little bit later on. The basic training regimen for 2nd Division cyclists was far more evolved than it was for 1st Division of Valcartier. One cyclist said it consisted of squad drill, PT, musketry, and bayonet drill, map reading, scouting, simple signaling, and route marches with specialized training for a signal section made up of one or two men from each platoon. A second major difference in Valcartier was the fact that the cyclists with the 2nd Division had bikes to train on. These arrived in December 1914, just before that cold winter set in. Cyclists uh, Ken Bally and uh, Elmer Swinnerton recalled, needless to say, Toronto winters are a bit severe for outdoor training, <laughs> particularly for cycling. They still are. All will have a vivid memory of our first ride along the ice covered pavements. Many were the spills, the curses, and the bruises, but the thrill of the new bikes offset it all. And that evening, we whistled Colonel Bogey as cheerfully as ever as we marched down to our mess hall under the exhibition grandstand. So let's talk a few minutes about the bikes. Most of the cyclists uh, rode Birmingham Small Arms Company, BSA, Mark IV bicycles once they were actually in the war, actually did the training on, uh, on planets. This, uh, the, the BSA model had been approved for Brit British military use in 1911 and was the most common bicycle used by British, Canadian, Australian, and New Zealand forces in the Great War. The 24-inch machine was officially a general service bicycle outfitted with coaster hubs, Mud guards, lamp, front and rear pannier characters, and a repair kit with spanners, tire repair kit, and a screwdriver. Also standard issue were clips for mounting a 303 Hotchkiss portable machine gun over the handlebars. That's for uh, short distances when going into action. And then another set of clips for carrying the gun through the frame for long distances on the march, as you'll see in this picture here. Like their British counterparts, full kit for Canadian cyclists included a veritable cornucopia supplies. Okay, a bicycle cap and a steel helmet, pants, putties, boots, socks and underwear, great coat, rubber cape, ground cheek, blanket, 120 rounds of ammunition, a handle bayonet, gas mask goggles, an entrenching tool, six ounces of lubricating oil, a comb brush, knife, spoon and a fork, and in addition to official kit, most of the cyclists also had, in one of their words, a certain amount of personal stuff and extra stuff like souvenirs. When fully loaded up, the cyclist weighed in at almost 90 pounds, well, I'd say at least, depending on how many souvenirs you had hanging off the handlebars. With the spring of 1915, 2nd Division recruits stationed at a camp exhibition were finally able to head outdoors for maneuvers. One recurring drill, which most great war recruits at the camp took part in at some point, was known as the Battle of the Humber. This was a maneuver. Called, recalled one cyclist that was designed to give officers in charge a chance of handling their forces under active service conditions. The Globe covered one Battle of the Humber in March 1915 that included over 2,000 soldiers, including the 2nd Division cyclists. The Globe wrote it up like this. 
The scheme consisted of a rear attack on a fairly strong enemy. The enemy was supposed to be retreating from the city to the east. His forces consisting of the Mounted Rifle Regiment, one battle of artillery with two guns, and one company of the 19th Battalion. The offensive force was composed of the 10th Battalion, two batteries of artillery, and the Divisional Cyclist Corps. The scene of the engagement covered a space of some three square miles, three quarters of a mile on each side of the old mill on the Humber River. On reaching the river, the retreating force found that the offensive had burned the bridges, and orders were sent out to the rear guard to hold the attacking force in check until the crossing could be negotiated. In the wooded section of the battleground, the division cyclists were engaged with the 19th Battalion from the 1st, but were forced back across the railway track before the main body of the 20th Battalion. <clears throat> and the artillery came up. The result of the engagement was a draw. The Western or attacking force had to drive in the Eastern or the retreating force. They did so, but the Eastern force delayed the process long enough to enable them to achieve their object. Now, not all maneuvers along the Humber were entirely military in nature. On March through the Valley, at some point in early 1915, cyclist Jock uh, Farquhar recalled a group of cyclists finding, in his words, a lot of people tobogganing down the bank on the river. We got hold of a couple of them and we piled on. Well, the first one went down all right and we were doing the same until some mutt's bayonet got under one side of the rig and over we went. So I guess the lesson here, leave your bayonets at home if you wanna do some good tobogganing. On another maneuver in April, 1915, the second division cyclists pedaled out to the family farm belonging to the company's beloved second in command and the future Premier of Ontario, Major Thomas Laird Kennedy. The farm was near present-day Tompkins Road in Dundas Street West. As an aside, for those, of like, for those of you like me who are unaware, Tompkins is actually a portmanteau of Thomas Kennedy. Kennedy was like many officers in the Great War. He was older, he was 35 at enlistment, and had a long history of public service. In 1899, Kennedy began his long career in politics when he was nominated to the local public school board. Almost as a joke, we'll call another future Ontario Premier, Bill Davis, Kennedy's retirement dinner. Kennedy was elected to municipal council three years later, serving in that capacity until the war. In 1904, Kennedy joined a local militia unit, the Mounted Governor General's Bodyguard, whose patron was the wealthy Denison family of West End Toronto. The GGBG, also known as Toronto's Calvary, had a long celebrated military history in Canada, having served in the Upper Canada Rebellion, the Northwest Rebellion, the Finian Raids, and the Boer War. While militia were not activated for duty in the Great War, the GGBG, like other units across the country, was active in local recruiting, both for local volunteers and within their own ranks. Kennedy and the GGBG's commander, George Taylor Dennison IV, enlisted in early December 1914 and received orders to establish a mounted unit. Dennison was made Lieutenant Colonel in charge of the 2nd Division Cyclist Company, Major Kennedy, his second in command. All right, back to Kennedy's farm. Uh, in April 1916, Denison and second command Kennedy organized a training exercise where cyclists were to serve as, quote, an attacking force with orders to capture a brickyard held by a party of 50. As one second division cyclist recorded in his diary after a very pleasant day, we made the 14 mile ride back to exhibition camp in one hour and 14 minutes exemplifying our value as a mobile force, the sea speed of locomotion exceeds any that could be made by cavalry. Or a car, I would suggest, trying to drive down the uh, gardener these days. Kennedy's service in the Great War was cut short by a serious accident uh, during advanced training at Big Bait Camp, England in June 1916. Near that camp was a steep conical hill, a continuation of the white chalk cliffs of Dover, and as one second division recalled, it was a real test of strength to stay on one's bikes right over the top. Only a few achieved this, mostly the lighter ones. It was on this hill that our beloved Major Kennedy came to grief. He usually led us down the hill on almost a free wheel. And one morning as he rounded the second hairpin turn near the bottom, he ran smack into a truck landing up on the front seat. In addition to many bad cuts and bruises, his jaw was broken completely destroying any claim he previously had to beauty. It was two or three months before he returned to us. All right, here's Kennedy as premier. Uh, notice the left side of his face, it's kind of caved in. That's from the accident. 
That's funny. The more research I do on the cyclists, the more I think the second division uh, boys were prone to accidents. So just prior to his crash, Kennedy and the cyclists got in some serious training rides through the grand and ancient English countryside. Canterbury Cathedral, Arundel Castle, the beautiful seaside village of Folkestone. But not all the sites were of such a vintage though, as one second division rider recalled. We had a big pile up riding along the beach near Hythe one morning when the boys were introduced to ladies and swimming, ladies swimming in one piece bathing suits. Up to that point, bathing beauties in Canada wore as many clothes in swimming as they did on the streets just prior to the Second World War. It is doubtful if even the Colonel himself kept his eyes front as we passed them, but of course he didn't have to keep his eyes on the bicycle ahead, many of the front wheel that had to be straightened before we got underway again. All right, recruitment for a third Canadian division began in August 1915 after the last of the second division ship for England in June. Recruiters for the third division uh, advertised for, quote, men with a fair education, some knowledge of map reading is desirable, young fellows who have had experience in surveying, engineering, or such office work as is performed by bank clerks have proved useful, men in the cycle, in the cyclist corps. Assembled in Toronto by the end of 1915, the third division cyclists, along with some other 15 units, were shipped across Lake Ontario for basic training at Paradise Grove, an area just west of Fort Niagara at Niagara on the Lake. Again, so that the National Fair could get underway on the exhibition ground. One cyclist recalled that the men were whipped into good shape with drilling, route marches, and running. They moved back to Camp Exhibition in Toronto at the end of October was a highlight for the third division cyclists less so for the fellow recruits. Rather than return by ship across the lake, headquarters designed a maneuver that combined training with a long 90 mile march around the lake end of Lake Ontario. Cyclist Tobias Kelly sets up the story like this. The distance being about 90 miles, camps were set up at various points approximately 15 miles apart in which the battalions rested on successive nights. Each unit marched with vanguards out to hunt out the enemy, which for the purpose of these maneuvers, the cyclists were chosen. On October 25th, they established camps some distance from the main highway at Grimsby, Sheridan, and Cooksville. Cyclist George Scroge picks up the story from this point. The Canadian cyclists were then to test the troops marching through by taking action in some form while they were approaching their billets for the night, while they were staying there at night, and then again when they were leaving in the morning. The cyclist's main task was to annoy each battalion after dark when it bedded down for the night. A good many original and nasty ideas were used to accomplish these objectives, and undoubtedly were responsible for making the cyclists unpopular with the infantry boys, who had their rest disturbed after a strenuous day's march by fireworks and other such annoyances. Back in Toronto, HQ designed one final outdoor maneuver before the winter of 1915 set in. This one, covered by the Toronto Star, extended beyond city limits at the time, from Mimico on the west side to Leaside Junction on the east, and included troops from both the Western Exhibition Camp and the Eastern Riverdale Barracks. Said the reporter for the Star, the object of the maneuver is to teach the troops to bivouac and find their own billets, establish headquarters camps, and put out outposts, just as if they'd been landed in a foreign country and had to prepare their own camp, and then be ready for inspection if staff officers visited their quarters, and also be ready for sudden mobilization to move forces. Every unit, including the six infantry battalions, three batteries, division cyclists, Army Medical Corps, and Veterinary Corps will be sent out in sections from the camp and will be expected to reach their allotted areas somewhere in the county by 10 o'clock, just as if they had disembarked from some troop ship and had to prepare camp. After they establish their quarters and lines of communications, all the battalion's artillery and other units will concentrate at the corner of Bathurst and Eglinton and then have lunch. They will be inspected and return to camp. The cyclists were assigned to set camp in an area between the Old Mill and Humber Bay on Bloor Street. Recruitment for the 4th Canadian Division began in February 1916, shortly after the 3rd Division left for England in January. One cyclist recalled the average age of the men in the 4th Division Cyclist Company was about 20 and were from many walks of life, but there were very few without high school education, coupled with a fair sprinkling at a university degree. As you can imagine, training for the 4th Division cyclists in the winter of 1916 was initially, as one put it, pretty well confined to route marches, 
physical training and lectures on map reading and military law. With spring though, the cyclists moved outside. <clears throat> Going through many of the same drills, the second and third division cyclists were put through, including many battles of the Humber. The fourth division cyclists also participated in some civic activities, including a Toronto favorite Sunday bicycle ride known as the Run to High Park. The Globe described one run in April 1917 like this. A remarkable bicycle run was staged yesterday morning from the South African Monument, University Avenue and Queen Street out to High Park. Exactly 264 bicyclists participated in the run, including the cyclist corps commanded by Mackay, who headed the procession, and a division of 10 lady cyclists. They were not part of the uh, Canadian Cyclist Battalion. A large crowd gathered to see the start of the run, before which a battery of motion picture camera took many feet of pictures. Just before the getaway, the cyclists gave an exhibition of bicycle drill. Enlistment for a fifth divisional cyclist company began almost immediately after the fourth sailed for England in April 1916. By early summer of that year, platoons from Kingston, Winnipeg, and Vancouver assembled in Toronto and then moved on to Paradise Grove. The fate of the fifth, though, like that of the fourth, seemed sealed from the start. According to Ken Pettis, we were called the divisional cyclist depot, and had we known what the words meant, that ought to have told us very plainly what was in store. Our ranks were plundered from the very beginning. Several new recruits were drawn into the two senior platoons still at exhibition camp who overseas a week after enlistment with the last of the fourth division. Of the five cyclist companies raised to fight in the Great War, the fifth spent the longest time in basic training in Canada. Nearly nine long months, according to Pettis. At Par Paradise Grove in the summer of 1916, one fifth division rider recalled, we put in full hours at Niagara. We covered our musketry there and the usual elementary training at HQ's request made a complete road and billeting survey the whole Niagara training area. I am sure we rode thousands of miles and I'm sure we swallowed several tons of dust. Ken Pettis recalled their time in paradise like this. We carried on maneuvers all over the Niagara Peninsula both day and night performed various duties for Camp HQ, from guards to messengers to orderlies. One memorable occasion, we patrolled the river road, searching every motor car for Germans who were supposed to be plotting to blow up the International Bridge. Back in Toronto and Cap Exhibition, by early fall, the 5th Division cyclists and their fellow recruits impatiently awaited word to move overseas. And to fill in the time, Pettis recalled how they, quote, fought the Battle of the Humber River a thousand times. We mapped out High Park again and again. And there was even a motion picture film of us. Incredibly, in the silent movie, The Division Cyclist survives and a copy exists here in the city of Toronto archives. And if you'll indulge me, and if I can make this work, uh, I'll play you the short two minute clip. Uh, again, there's no sound. So let's see how we, uh, how we make out here. I'll just let this run.
<laughs> I love that clip. And at the end of November, the Globe ran the following story. The other day, the cyclist made a run through uh, Toronto to Hamilton, returning the following day. The start was made in three inches of snow. <laughs> but the cyclist made an average speed of nine and a half miles an hour without casualties. Again, I challenge you to make, uh, to make that rate of speed along the gardener in a car. The fifth division cyclist also did a musketry course at Long Branch, held according to Pettis on three of the worst sub-zero days of that winter. So the fifth uh, company finally shipped out for England in January 1917. Overall, the basic training Canadian cyclists underwent in Canada didn't prepare them for the fighting they'd face on the Western Front. But nor was it designed to. Months of advanced training would take place in camps in England and France prior to moving on to the front. In Canada, the countless marches, the range practice, and other basic drills served, in Pettis' words, to bring this disparate army together. The men marched together, they ate together, they slept together. And as another cyclist reflected, if our training bore little relationship to the type of warfare then being waged in France, where so-called mounted troops were fighting grimly in the trenches of Sanctuary Wood, well, it was interesting training anyhow. For most of the Great War, Canadian cyclists performed a few of the specialized, or performed few of the specialized roles they trained for in Great Britain at camps like Salisbury Plain and Shorncliffe. At battles like Ypres in 1915 and the Somme in 1916, their work, in the words of one cyclist, consisted largely of carrying ammunition and other supplies, burying cable and other digging parties, with the odd turn at stretcher bearing and burying the dead bodies scattered around all over. At Vimy, one rider recalled this. Towards the end of October 1916, a rumor started that we were to be tunnelers, and we started up the line for Neuville saint vaast via the longest communication trench in the world, the Denis La Roque. We then started putting most of Vimy Ridge in sandbags, helping Imperial Tunneling Company dispose of the chalk they dug out of the galleries and tunnels under the German line, including the famous Grange and Goodman tunnels, which were used in the final attack. The Germans were also busy digging their own tunnels. In the underground theater below Vimy Ridge, the opposing sides tried to destroy each other's work with artillery and trench mortar fire. Another tactic was to dig a tunnel or mine beneath the enemy's tunnel work pack it with explosives, and detonate. Cyclist Private Dick Warren played a role in these underground operations at Vimy. He recalled one episode in his time there like this. As each mine had been packed with m and and wired, the chamber was sealed and left till it was time to blow. These had to be patrolled, and I was picked as one of the detail, whose job was to listen and report Fritzy's activities below ground. It was a lonesome and eerie job at times. Our equipment consisted of flashlights, candle, geophones. The latter were similar to a doctor's stethoscope and had metal containers at one end and were very sensitive being able to pick up the slightest sound. Armed with these, I entered the Double Crozier Tunnel, so named for twin craters on top and which were filled with water. This mine was branched and I took left branch first. I went along the gallery and I found it flooded. My candle sputtered out and this warned me of gas. And of course, I didn't linger there. I went down the right branch for quite a long way before gas stopped me, and so retraced my steps till I found a safe spot. Then, putting a space on the floor for the geophones, I sat down and lit a cigarette, despite the threat of gas I might add here. With my back against the pit prop and my legs spread wide, I placed the plugs in my ears, and hearing Jerry at work, I felt at peace in the world. The rats, whose eyes reflected the light from the candle, came so close, and no closer, and they didn't bother me, but their squeak sounded very loud through the geophone. Then a call in nature had to be answered. And not wishing to move from my comfortable spot, I proceeded to answer it in the easiest way. A terrific rumble of rushing water sounded in my ears, and with the thoughts of the flooded left branch in my mind, I figured that I was trapped and I bought it. With my eyes almost popping out and the wind up a mile high, I snatched the plugs from my ears, and all was peaceful again. Ah, uh, guys and their humor. The cyclists role in the Great War changed radically during the last 100 days campaign that began at Amiens on August the 8th. It was during this campaign that the Allies finally rested the Germans from their trenches and pursued them in open warfare through, the East, through Eastern France and into Belgium. In Dick Ellis's words, Canadian cyclists finally came into their own during the 100 days campaign. The open warfare of the following engagement gave them a chance to carry out the work for which they had enlisted. 
One episode in this campaign, The Pursuit from the Sense, nicely illustrates this work, I think. On the morning of October 17, 1918, Canadians held an almost 20 mile front along the west side of the Sense Canal, just north of the city of Cambrai. Early morning reconnaissance confirmed that the Germans were in full retreat, pulling back eight miles to a position called the Herman Line anchored at Valenciennes, where they were hoping to restart trench warfare. The German plan, however, required time to deploy, which they hoped to buy with a well-planned system of demolition that destroyed the railways, blew up the bridges and road junctions, laid mines at frequent intervals in their main road, flooded the canals, and fought skill for rearguard action with specially trained machine gun detachments. The Allies aimed to interrupt the Germans' well-planned system of demolition by maintaining constant contact with the retreating enemy and, quote, push them aside if possible. In the Canadian sector, this task fell to Brigadier General Raymond Brutenel's mobile Canadian Independent Force, which consisted of armored cars, motorized machine gun cars, lorries fitted with trench mortars, cavalry, motorcycles, mobile engineers, 300 or so cyclists. <clears throat> On the morning of October 17, the Canadian cyclists began their move across the Sunset Canal, with the 1st, the 2nd, and the 4th Divisions achieving their positions on the eastern side of the canal around midnight. Brutnell's troops got into action the next morning. Cyclist Alan McNabb summarized the cyclist contributions over the next five days like this. The independent force we were with was now organized as pursuit troops, operating with the cavalry mounted six-inch howitzers and engineers, and getting in perhaps our most telling work. We cleared out many a village and machine gun nest in advance of the infantry and protected engineers when the latter constructed or repaired the bridges across the canals and streams. We also tested the roads and villages for mines and booby traps. Incidentally, on entering places like Dereme, they were nearly mobbed by the civilians. This actually would become a consistent theme for the Canadians as they liberated over 70,000 civilians in 52 towns and villages before reaching Valenciennes on November the 1. I'll let McNabb finish. Being out in advance most of the time, we never knew when we were going to run into trouble and lost quite a few men killed or wounded. Sometimes it would be snipers, sometimes machine guns, sometimes field artillery using open sights, that is firing directly at us from positions in the open. The almost 30 mile pursuit of the retreating Germans from the Sanse Canal on October 17th to the Canal Lescaux on the 23rd represented some of the Canadian cyclists most telling work for the Canadians in general, it was one of the few times during the war that they were in full motion, experiencing almost as much of a challenge keeping supply lines and artillery connected to the quickly advancing forces as engaging German rearguard actions. And the key to the advance was the success of Brutenell's force, which worked at the bleeding edge of the push. In an open letter to Canadian Corps, Major General Sir David Watson of the 4th Division expressed his appreciation of the valuable assistance rendered us by the units at our disposal by the Corps during these last few days. In Watson's words, I refer particularly to the work of the squadrons of cavalry, the cyclists, and the armored cars, and affiliated guns in lorries with crews. From first to last, these units have cooperated with our infantry with the utmost gallantry and vigor. They have carried out the orders and work allotted to them with the greatest satisfaction. Time and again, armored cars have been sent around helping out flanking machine gun positions. On certain occasions, these armored cars have been sent out with parties of engineers, dropping these at various points where roads required mending and then coming back for additional loads. And the cyclists have been most valuable in their excellent patrol duties as well, carrying dispatches and securing information regarding enemy movements and positions of our own troops. The Hundred Days Campaign of the Great War offered proof that the Canadian Corps had evolved into an innovative, efficient and highly professional fighting force, and that Canadian cyclists had made small but important contributions to that evolution. These, however, came at a deadly cost. Out of a total enlistment of 1,138 men, 261 were killed or wounded, a casualty rate of 23%, one of the highest of all Canadian units. I want to end tonight with a word about Captain Dick Ellis, the unofficial guardian of the cyclist legacy. Alice was born in England, but moved to Toronto when he was young, he met his childhood sweetheart at the Balmy Beach Club just before the war started and returned to marry her when it was over. 
1934, Ellis formed the Canadian Corps Cyclist Battalion Association and worked tirelessly to organize annual reunions until 1983. He also edited the association's periodical, The Cyclone, and penned various regimental histories. Much of, content, much of the content for this lecture and for my book, Riding Into Battle, published by Dundurn Press, is based on Ellis's work. At a 1937 reunion here in Toronto, Ellis donated a bottle of Paul Rouget champagne to the Cyclists Association and charged that it be drank by its last two surviving members. Incredibly, Ellis himself shared that bottle with fellow cyclist Billy Richardson in 1992. Richardson died in 1995, leaving Ellis the sole surviving member of the Canadian Corps Cyclist Battalion. Longtime resident of St. Clair Avenue Road neighborhood, cyclist Ellis died on August 14, 1996, at the very good age of 100. All right, uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. I do appreciate the opportunity to be able to share this uh, story with you. Um, I'm happy to take any questions you've got. You can either uh, uh, pop them into the chat or I'm happy to take them uh, over uh, microphone as well. Just a reminder, if you're gonna use the microphone to unmute yourself first, please. Hmm. Any question? Oh, there's one. Oh, there's Casey from Facebook. Can you let everyone know about the plan to see the cyclists recognized with the battle honors? Uh, I could, Casey, but I can't remember all the details of it. Um, where's the best place that they can find information about that? I know that you've been spearheading this initiative and been very, very active in order to get the recognition they deserve. Is there a place that uh, I can send the audience to find out more information? So Ted, uh, hi, I'll come off mute actually, just because it's probably easier. Thanks, um, Casey. Th thank you very much for the presentation. It was fantastic. Um, I'm really glad to get to listen in and it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to read your book as well because I think you've just done a lovely job of, of telling the story of the battalion. Um, so uh, like Ted, I share an interest uh, in the, the cyclists. This is not about me, so I'm not trying to hijack this, um, but I did some research beginning in 2016 which uh, indicated that these cyclists were missed by the variety of uh, battle honors committees, which sat in the aftermath of the first war to adjudicate on the award of battle honors in Canada. Um, and so uh, the Directorate of History and Heritage intends to review uh, the case of the cyclists uh, this coming spring uh, in 2021 which is really exciting because uh, they're going to be recognized, we think, uh, based upon DHH's, uh, sorry, the Director of, Directorate of History and Heritage's uh, uh, recommendation to the government. Um, so 100 years late is better late than never. So anyways, I'll stop talking, but thanks so much, Ted. Thanks, Casey. Uh, just, just one other um, uh, reference. Casey uh, has started a, a Facebook group a few years ago uh, that gets the descendants of the cyclists uh, together, and it is a... Uh, Fascinating, fascinating place to, uh, to watch conversations between the, uh, the descendants happen. Uh, Ted Rubble has a question. He said that other countries have cyclist units as well, or was it a Canadian specialty? Uh, most countries had um, cyclist units um, in the war. And like I say, the, the cycles, the bikes had been a part of the military landscape since the, the Boer War, in fact. Um, there was actually one famous cyclist that came out of the, the Great War, and he got a who's an iron cross for, for his work. Uh, and he went on to become uh, the Fuhrer of Germany. Uh, so <laughs> uh, Hitler was actually a, a, a cyclist as well. So yeah, that was very, very common, a very commonplace thing in, uh, in the Great War, even in the Second World War. Any more questions? No? Well, that's one thing I didn't know. I didn't. I knew Hitler was in the First World War, but I didn't realize he was a cyclist. Well, you see, you learn something every day. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.